you need um, a, a message, a bulletin, be sure to raise your hand and I have something to give to you. I think it's interesting that when we study relationships, the place that one of the most important places to go is the Ten Commandments. And most people don't look at them as an example of what, how God wants to build a relationship. They look at God as being someone more that's upset with them. He doesn't like them because they're a sinner. And he has ways, he sets up all these rules to punish them. So they're always thinking God's mad. And God's got something he's trying to do to pick on people because he's unhappy with them. But that's completely contrary to the nature of God. God's into relationships. He made man in his image, which is an image that requires fellowship. That was God's design. That man may have fellowship with each other and with their God. So therefore the Ten Commandments is an example of God wanting to put in place something that would begin to develop a relationship with His people that would be long term. From generation to generation. We've looked at the first four commandments. We're going to look at the fifth commandment today. The first four commandments have to do with God. Let there be only one God, the one true God. Let there be no other gods before me. Let's not profane the name, the great name, of this above all names, which is God or Jesus. And then the last week we looked at the subject of rest. Do you realize that Israel was the first nation on earth to ever take a day off? Up until the time of Israel, nobody took a day off. The world was controlled by kings or queens and kingdoms and servants. And so the servants never had a day off. It was seven days a week. It was mostly slavery. And then along came God that took the slaves of Egypt, which was Israel, and said, now I'm going to give you freedom, and I'm going to put in place something that would be the best thing for you. I'm going to show you what I originally had planned for mankind, which was to work six days and have a day of rest. And on that day of rest, I'm going to give you a day that's worshipful. It's to say to worship me and then the rest thereby. Rest being, as we learned last time, anything that's not the regular job you do during the week. That means moms, you're supposed to have a day of rest. You're supposed to be queen for a day every week. Amen. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because moms, working moms, household moms, whatever, you're to have a day of worship and rest. Yeah. The same for the man, the same for the woman. And this is what God's plan is for mankind. Now, if you work on Sunday, as we learned last week, well, you need to find a day during the week when is your worship day and your rest day, that if you work on Sunday. Otherwise, Sunday should be the day you set aside for rest. That means, moms, have something prepared for food. If you're not going to eat out, have it there to be warmed up so you don't have to do the work of taking care of the kitchen, the work of anything else, but to rest. That means maybe... If you have children, you send them off to the neighbor. But I, you know, whatever works for you, you need to plan for a day of rest. My point is, that commandment was a very important commandment because it was a commandment given to the people of Israel to build faith in them. He said to them, they were murmuring. They were, remember this about the slaves of Egypt. They were murmurers. I mean, you'd be a murmurer too if you were under bondage and nothing you said mattered, and every day you had a job to do. Even though it said, as we learned last week, they were very well fed. They had all kinds of fruit, all kinds of meat. They were very well fed because Pharaoh knew that a well-fed servant is a working servant. So, But they, their opinion didn't matter. That's why they murmured all the time. They murmured against Pharaoh. Now they're set free to go into freedom... But they don't know what to do with that freedom, so they start murmuring against Moses. And they murmured that they all they got was this supernatural food every day called manna. And they murmured about it. Manna in the morning, manna in the evening. We, we don't want just manna. We want something for me. So God set up quail in the afternoon. But he said this, I'm going to test you in this, that you're going to trust me that you're going to have just enough to eat each day. You can't keep it. You can't hoard it. Except on the day before the Sabbath. Then I'm going to supernaturally provide you enough for two days. But it won't rot and stink like the other would be if you tried to keep it. He was testing them for what purpose? To stop the murmuring. And to have them move into faith. That has a lot to do with the next commandment, which is the commandment we're looking at today. Each commandment builds on itself. 
Four towards God, six towards each other. Honor your parents. Amen. Interesting commandment that it's in the top ten. Honor your father and your mother with a promise that your days may be long upon the land which your Lord is God is giving you. Now notice what it says. He's talking directly at this time, and we're going to look at some other scriptures about today and how it relates to the church. But this is a direct promise to the people of Israel. Honor your father and mother, and you will live long on the land that I'm giving to you. Now what did they do? Honor your father and mother. That means you're the adult. You've got a father or mother. Start honoring them. But what were they doing? They were murmuring against Moses. And Moses said, you're not murmuring against me. You're murmuring against God. You're dishonoring God. So what the commandment was, stop being dishonorable. Honor your father and mother. And therefore, realize that your father in heaven you need to honor too. But what did they do? They didn't stop. And therefore, all the adults over 20 years of age died in the wilderness over the 40 year period from the time that commandment was made until the children started honoring God and honoring their parents. And therefore, they were the generation that entered into the promised land. But that slave generation did not heed the words of this commandment and therefore became and continued to be a honorless nation until the children began to be a nation of honor. You follow that over 40 years, you see this is true. And the Joshua generation was a generation of honor. So honor is very important. Honor produces faith. Let me say that again. Honor produces faith. Hebrews 3.19 says, We say they could not enter in because of unbelief. They did not honor God, and therefore they did not obey God. They continued to murmur and complain, and they died by the snake, and they died by the earthquake, and they died in the wilderness. The children saw the results of God supernaturally supplying and the results of their parents being disobedient to not honor God. And they began to honor God, believe in God, and they began to grow in faith to where they became the Joshua generation. They believed God to the point that they crossed the river without Moses with a rod. They crossed it by the word of God, by the Ark of the Covenant, going into the river. Then it parted and they crossed. They took on the strongest fortification in the known world at that time, which was Jericho, with walls that were six chariots wide. And God said, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to walk around it until I say shout. That takes faith, doesn't it? And they did exactly like he said. And the walls were, as they found in the excavations now of the walls, the walls didn't crumble. The walls were literally driven down in the ground like God stepping on them with his foot. They saw walls crushed into the ground like you would an ant. They were a nation of faith because they began to honor God. And they saw their parents receive the consequences of not honoring God. This is another example. This is with Jesus in Mark chapter 6 of why honor is important. Mark chapter 6 You've got a few verses in your notes. I'm going to read you a couple others. Mark 6, the, the first verses before Mark 6, are important to go with the ones I gave you in verse 4. It, it says, Jesus came to his hometown. And when he went out from there and came to his own city, his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who were hearing him were astonished. Now, they weren't astonished in a nice way. They were saying, well, we're... Where does this guy get this? I mean, come on. This is the guy that's, you know, he was, that's that bastard son born to the carpenter. I mean, you know, what's he got to do about anything? He's not a Pharisee or a Sadducee. He wasn't trained in our universities. What's he know? But they hear what he says and they can't say, wow. 
And so he, and, and, and what wisdom is this that's given to him? Why does he have this kind of wisdom? And why is he doing all these works? It wasn't words of praise. It was words of criticism and dishonor. He continues. And he, isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary? See, not, not, not the son of Joseph. Follow that? Mm -hmm. The illegitimate son of Mary. And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And oh, by the way, are his sisters here today with us? I mean, he's just one of us. And they were offended at him. And Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor except in his own hometown. A prophet's not without honor except in Washington, D.C. Um, among his own relatives and his own house. Not without honor. And Jesus tried to do some works there. Now notice the connection. We're talking about dishonor. And then we're talking about the power of God. And Jesus tried to do some of the mighty works he did there. What are the mighty works he did? Raise the dead. Healed lepers. Blind people could see. He tried to do those same works he was doing everywhere else. And he marveled at what? Of their dishonor? Of their unrespect? He went right to the heart of the matter. Unbelief. And could do only a few things. Today, we have become a nation of dishonor. It's really... I mean, I can see it from my short lifetime of being a young man where Father Knows Best was on TV. And uh, when you went to school, you, you learned at home to honor your parents. And you learned at school to honor your teachers. And they had someone called the principal. And he had a paddle of honor. And, and if you didn't honor what the teacher said, you went to the principal's office. I know. Three times I entered into that office. And I found out that each time you saw him, things didn't get better. And he wasn't one to really talk too much. He had a paddle <laughs> with a little hose in it. He said, now this, your first time here, you only get this many Bam, bam. He said, now if you come back, you're going to get bam, 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 bam. And then if you come back again, you're going to get bam, 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 bam. And you're going to know what the paddle of correction is. The third time worked for me because he was true to his work. And he continued <laughs> to straighten me out. There was honor in the schools of America because there was obedience. Amen. And I realize that I'm hitting on a really hard subject of corporal punishment. But if you spare the rod, you, the you bring up the child of dishonor. And they'll be unhonorable. Mm -hmm. See, there's a reason it says in Ephesians 6, it says, Children, obey your parents of the Lord, for this is right. Obey means honor. You can't have honor without obedience. Some parents get caught up in this thinking, well, if they like me, then that's what it matters. No, if they don't obey you, you they don't honor you. Therefore, it's a dishonorable situation. Honor requires obedience. Honor requires submission. It's a military word, I put it in your notes, that means to submit without question. That's what you get to learn in the army. You, uh, you don't ask the drill sergeant how many miles you should march. You don't ask the drill sergeant if you should get up at 3 a.m. You don't ask the drill sergeant if this is going to help you or not. I mean, you do what the drill sergeant says because you are submitting to the authority he has and you are an honorable soldier that way. That's why it's a military word. The centurion came to Jesus and said, Just say your word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, well, it's okay, I'll come to him. He said, no, you don't need to. I am a man under authority. I am an honorable man. I follow the directions of the one over me. And my men are honorable. They follow the directions that I give them. We are an army of honor. Therefore, all you have to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled at what? His faith. His faith came from being an honorable person. And an honorable man of authority. And an honorable man under authority. You see, honor causes faith. Faith cannot 
arise in a believer. This is going to be hard for some believers. Because we live in a world today that has become a take care of me. I come to church to be met. All my needs met. I come to church for you to smooth me, ooze me, coos me. Uh, that's why I'm at church. But where a church is supposed to be a place you learn how to be obedient to God and follow God so that you're a person growing in faith. Therefore, you are a person of honor because you honor God. What we have created is a church, like I said earlier, of complacency. They don't come to church to grow in faith. They come to church to just get what they want, so they're complacent. They're not honorable towards God. And then they complain when their prayers aren't being answered because you're not a person of honor. And you'll see in a moment, you're just a person of entitlements. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. See, honor is to be the basis of our lives. Jesus could do no mighty works because they wouldn't honor him. The centurion walked in faith because he was a man of honor. So honor brings faith. If you want to have prayers answered, be a person of honor. Honor your pastor. Honor your wife. Honor your husband. Honor your country. Don't speak about those in authority in a, in a murmuring, critical way. Speak with them of honor. You may not agree with what they are doing, but you can always speak about them with honor. If you want your prayers answered, you've got to walk in honor. God's not going to answer prayers of believers that are dishonorable. Because honor brings faith. Honor also produces blessings. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment. Now look, he's adding something to the first commandment. in Exodus 20. Look what it says. It says that you may live long upon the earth. But look at Ephesians 6. That it may be well with you, and you will live long. Look at what's added. Living well. What's the good to live long if you're living in hell? Hmm? What, what's the good of having a... A have a life that's full of all kinds of problems and difficulties every day. Is that a good life? No. If you're one that honors your parents, you will not only live long, but you'll live well. There's a key. It says children obey. Children don't learn honor by a conversation. They don't learn honor by time out. They don't learn honor, honor, uh, honor by rationalizing. They learn honor, honor by obeying. Well, I don't like it. I don't want to do that. Well, I didn't ask you if you want to do that. I'm your parent. This is what you do. You live in my house? Yes. If you want to live, continue to live in my house, you do what I say. My house, my <laughs> Now, when they get old enough to not live in your house, this is where honor kicks in. They learn obedience while you're there. And then that obedience leads them to a place of being honoring you when they're no longer in your home. Jesus was an example of that. In Luke 2 it says, Jesus submitted to his parents in everything, and he grew in favor and wisdom. And if you follow Jesus' life out, he honored his mother all the way to the cross. Yeah. Even on the cross, and all the misery and the suffering he's going through, he said, John, this is your mother. I'm going to honor my mom in my last breath and give her someone to take care of her because I honor her. Amen. See, honor didn't stop when you leave home. Honor starts when you're on your own out of the obedience you learned while you're there. Some people say, well, you've got to earn this or I'll not honor you. Well, that's a lie. If you start being obedient, it has nothing to do with them earning your obedience. It has to do with you being obedient because they're your parent and you're in their house. And if they're obedient to you, they'll be obedient to the school. If they're obedient to the school, they'll be obedient to who they work for. If they're obedient to you and the school and who they work for, it'll be an obedient, honorable society. But what do we have? If you want to live well and live long, it comes by honoring your parents, by being obedient and following them as you should. That's why the 
The word honor is a very important word. It, it, it's a word, it's a military word that talks about submitting to those in authority without hesitation. Uh, we have a society that wants to argue about everything, wants to have reasons why we should do everything. The problem with that is uh, honor is an attitude. It's, it's what says we are to honor one another. We are to have an attitude. On, husbands honor wives. Wives honor each other. Church members honor church members. Uh, we honor one another. That's an attitude. I have an attitude. I want to honor Frank by finding out what I can help Frank in his life with. Follow me? So I, to honor my brother, I would talk to my brother and ask my brother how I can pray for him, how I can be a blessing to his life. I don't come to my brother and be demanding, this is what you need to do for me, Frank. That's not honor. See, honor something that's an attitude of willingness, submissiveness. This is why the, it says that the husband's to love the wife and the wife is to submit. That means the wife has to have a willingness to want to honor her husband by being submissive. He doesn't say that to the guy because he's not smart enough to be submissive. He just needs to learn to love. <laughs> if he learns to love, he can handle the rest of his problems. But he doesn't know how to love, so if you don't figure that one out first, submission's not going to do you any good. So you've got to learn to love first, and then you'll be willing to submit to your wife. Love comes first. Women already know how to love. Don't tell them. So they need to learn submission. What's submission? That's honor. So willingness to be someone thinking of them more than yourself. Helping them more than yourself. That's submission. Oh, I'm stepping on a lot of toes today. Anyway, this is for those out there. They need to hear this more than anybody else. Why is honor so important? Well, it is a military word that talks about submitting without questions. Why is that important? Well, Proverbs 30 is why it's important. Boy, this is, this is a powerful insight into society. And if you want to read this, it, it'll, it'll shock you. Because it's a description of us. Proverbs 30. In our society I'm talking about. Yep. Not you. But our society. Proverbs 30. There is a generation that curses its father. And does not bless its mother. There's a generation that's pure in their own eyes. Yet it's not washed from its filthiness. There's a generation. Oh how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are like swords. Mm. Words that are like daggers speaking out against another. Whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor, the needy. The leech, notice this, has two daughters. Look what they're saying. The leech, bloodsuckers, give, 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 give. Watch it. Which one's in next? There's three things that never are satisfied. Four never say enough. The grave, the womb, the earth. It's not satisfied. What are the fire that never says enough? The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother. What happens? The ravens of the valley will pick out the eye and the young eagles will eat the rest. Woo! The two sisters don't seem to fit in this. Give, give, give. Well, they do when you think of entitlement. Yep. You see, entitlements, an honorless generation is consumed with entitlements. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And it's never enough, it's never enough, it's never enough, it's never enough. That's our generation. And our Congress and White House are consumed with it. Just give, 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 give. Title. It's destroying, and it will destroy our nation. We'll consume ourselves if we continue to go down this road. Why does it happen this way? People of honor don't want entitlements. Let me say that again. There were immigrants that came to this nation that didn't come for a handout. They came for a new life. They came to build a new life, to work to earn that new life. 
Today, by and large, most of the people that come here come for entitlement. They will continue to consume and consume and consume because they think they're entitled to it. And they'll riot and bring control over the nation if we continue to allow it because they think they are entitled to everything. Because they're honorless. Unless they change, become people that work, and become honorable, they'll be honorless. We have created a society, unfortunately. Everybody in the poverty level, lower income, the majority thinks they're entitled to everything. We should help people. We should give out things. But not to where we just continue to feed this entitlement idea that you need to pay for me. You need to give to me. You need to, this is, that was not the purpose of it. And it should not be the purpose. The purpose should be to help a person to become honorable. And be able to provide for their own life and their own family. I know I'm doing a political statement, but it's, it fits with what the scriptures say about honoring your parents. It starts there. If it starts in the home, then it comes to be as a part of the education and then become a business and society. But if it doesn't start there in the home, what you have is honorlessness. And that breeds entitlement ideas. That breeds us the statements that are here that uh, my wife looked up for me. Uh, entitlement has taken on a critical sense. If someone has a sense of entitlement, that means the person believes he deserves certain privileges and he's arrogant about it. The term culture of entitlement suggests that many people now have highly unreasonable expectations about what they're entitled to. Yep. Think of it. Unrealistic expectations about what they're entitled to. Now you think, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. It has a lot to do with the Bible. Honor wants to produce you a destiny, a good destiny, that you will live well, Deuteronomy 5.16, and you'll have a long life. That's what honor does. Entitlement doesn't do that. Entitlement leads to offense. Being offended leads to anger. Yeah. Anger leads to hate, and hate leads to murder. It's no coincidence that honor and murder go right beside each other. Honor your parents, you should not murder. If you're dishonoring your parents, you'll begin to be one that thinks of entitlement, what everybody owes you, how everybody should treat you, how everybody should act towards you, and when they don't, you become offended, and the more offended you become, the more you begin to think that Somehow your anger should be shown, so you take a gun and you start shooting everybody in your school because you didn't get what you were entitled to. Come on. Because you grew up a dishonorable family and a dishonorable son, and therefore now you do something people said, how can you commit that kind of murder? Because he started off with dishonor, and he began to be one that felt he was entitled to certain things, and now he's one who's gone into a fence. To murder. Come on. True. They did a study, uh, and we did this one Wednesday night, we did a study on ethics from Chuck Cosa Ministries, and it was an interesting study because it was talking about what caused the financial crisis that we had, and that was due to greed, of course. But one of the things they did in this, they showed a study of prison inmates over about 15 years. They were trying to find what was the common thing that caused these inmates to go back to go to prison. Was it the poverty level? Was it the education level? Was it a good parent, bad parent? What they found was something very interesting. It, they found that in the same family with several siblings, whether it was a nice neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, what they found was that like three kids in the family, two did just fine. Same parents, same neighborhood, same income. Two did well. One chose to go the wrong way. They found this to be a common thread in every... Everything they looked at had nothing to do with society, had nothing to do with finances, had nothing to do with where you live, had nothing to do but one thing. One decided to be disobedient to their parents. And they kept being disobedient and dishonoring their parents to where they then began to dishonor their teachers. And then they began to dishonor anybody in authority. And next thing you know, they have become a criminal. 
same family, same environment, same everything. Two out of three kids obeyed and became honorable. One didn't. You see, a dishonorable person falls into offense. I got a lot of scriptures on this, and, and Luke chapter 4 is one that help you to see this, and I hope clearly. And I don't have these in your notes because I'm out of my notes now. So just mur murder begins by an offense in one's heart. Now let me help you see this. Luke chapter 4. It's not in your notes, so don't panic. There's Bibles in the chairs in front of you, and, and I'll read these to you. Luke chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. Watch this one. This is interesting. It, it says, Jesus had come to the synagogue. Now, this is where he makes that tremendous statement in Luke chapter 4, 18, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've come to anoint, to, to preach the gospel of the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. I mean, what a tremendous fulfillment of Scripture he's saying to them. But what was their reaction? <laughs> Those in the synagogue, when they heard all this stuff, were filled with wrath and rose up and wanted to kill him by throwing him off the cliff. Offense, being offended, caused them to have such anger they wanted to kill Jesus. Look at Luke 7 in a moment, and I'll show you that one about John the Baptist, but let's, let's follow offense out first. Hold your finger there on Luke 7. Offense is from the Greek word. Scandalon. It, it means stumbling stones. This is it. Watch, watch this. Offense or being offended means stumbling stones. So follow this out. It's from the word scandalon in the Greek, which means the word scandal. What does a scandal do to someone? They stumbled. See? And that stumbling will cause many to be offended by their scandal. Another word for scandal on is the word stick. Stick. Yeah, stick. It's talking about the stick that the trapper uses to snare. Remember back in those days they had this little box thing and they had a stick and they put the, the, the bait inside the box and so when they grabbed the bait, they pulled the stick out and the box fell on top of them. That's how they trapped that's that little stick. It's called scandalon. It's the offense. It's what caused the animal to stumble into the box. Offense is what brings a person into a place of stumbling to cause them to be angry and offended. And then they go from that anger to hate. And that hate can lead, in some cases, to murder. Jesus said, if you even think about murdering the person in your head, it's the same thing as you do in the act. Why? Because that's where it starts. When you think about that person, if they do that one more time, I know what I'm going to do to them. What are you doing? You're setting up a snare for yourself. The devil's going, oh. And husbands and wives do this all the time. If you do that one more time, I'm leaving you. Oh, really? The devil's going, now there's an idea. Why don't we do that? So out of their mouth they've snared themselves. They've made their marriage worse. Because they say it. If you do I'm I'm over I'm finished with you, then I'm moon with you. Well I, I mean I'm okay, you're fine. We are gonna send you to the moon. So snaring by the words you say. You can do that at your business. Well, they treat me that way one more time, I'm quitting. What do they do? They treat you that way one more time because you set up the snare out of your own mouth and the devil says, good, I want you broke anyway. Like yep. Offense comes as a snare. Now, Jesus said in Romans 9.33, he was a stumbling block. So you really got a choice to make about stumbling blocks, about offense. Matthew 5, 43. I, I don't know, I'm going this way, but we're going to go here, so just stay with me. This is what the Lord's want me to do, so. Matthew 5, 43. 
You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now this is what they believed prior to what Jesus said. This is what the law taught them. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemies. Hmm. Sounds like our society, doesn't it? Love the Republicans, but hate the Democrats. I mean, isn't that that's in how it works, right? Yeah, no, yeah. Is it? But I say to you, love your Democrats. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who say bad things about you. Do good to those who what? Hate. You. Hate. It's a pretty strong word, hate, isn't it? And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Well, this verse right here will teach you how to be a person of honor. Right here. You want to learn how to walk in honor? Do what that verse says. Because you're going to tend to want to be an honorless person. You're going to tend to be someone who does not want to love the Nancy Pelosi. You do not want to pray for her. You do not want to ask God's blessing on her life. You just rather her be out of sight forever. You know what I'm saying? I watch her and I go, I am sick at my stomach. But you know, I, I, I say that to myself and I say, Lord... Could you just, you know, just sort of run a truck over her tomorrow? I mean, you know, that's what I think. You know, but, you know, I, but I don't do... But, you see what I'm saying? Now, is that honorable? No. That's honorless. To be an honorable person, here's what I need to do for Nancy Pelosi. Are you ready? First of all, I need, watch this, to not curse her. But love her. That hurts. Now, this, this isn't the kind of love that says, I want to be your friend. This is godly love. What's that? I was forgiven. God forgave me when I was not lovely. And I was a sinner, so I'm going to love her with the same kind of love God has for me. Right? Is that what it says? Don't answer it. Some of you just can't get it out of your mouth. Love Nancy Pelosi. Say, come on, say it with me. I love Nancy Pelosi. See, that's where it starts. I'm serious. That's where it starts. In your prayer time, you say, Lord, I love. You get it? That's where it starts. Huh? Some of you can't even say it. You need to practice this. All right, number two, bless the one who curses you. How do you know bless someone, cur what do you do if someone's cursing you? Well, I'm going to defend myself. They're not going to say things about me. I'm going to let them know what I think. I'm going to put on Facebook what the truth is. So everybody can read the real story. Is that what you do? Very much a matter of choice. You, have to love by choice. you love by choice. This, this whole this whole statement by Jesus is all about making the right choice. The choices they see they used to validate hate in Israel. You know, these are the people that were taught to pick up the stone, <laughs> kill people. I mean, hey, hey, you know, love your your love your nation, but hate your enemies. And God, Jesus say, look, we got we we can't be a nation of honor. If we don't choose to do the right things. And look, I'm on this, so just stay with me. It says, do good to those who hate you. Yeah. Hmm? What could you do good to someone that hates you? Do it all the time. What do you do good? Well, give them the same opportunity you give someone else. Whatever that might be. You don't, you're not biased towards them. You're not... You're going to do good to them. What can you do good for them? And then, then the next one's the, the one that's most important. Pray. Pray for the ones who use and persecute you. Pray. Now why is these verses so important? Because you won't commit murder if you love your enemy. Pray for your enemy. Hmm? 
what do you turn around? You turn around the offense. They're offending you, and you become someone who's taken that offense, and you've turned away from it. And instead, you've chosen to not be snared by the offense that's come. Instead, you've chosen to show love and pray. And you now are a person of honor because you've chosen to be a person of honor. And therefore, life's going to go well. And you're going to have a good, long life. See, it's not Botox. And it's not what pills you can take. And it's not what procedures you can take. You want to have a long, well life? Be a person of honor. Honor those in authority over us, whether we agree with them or not. Honor our parents, if your parents still abide on this planet. Choose to to honor one another and you will find that you walk in the wisdom of the Lord. These are scriptures on relationships and Jesus fulfilled the law by bringing the messages he brought on how it was to work and the principles were to work out and that's why he said things like seek first the kingdom. And he said, if you murder in your thoughts, you're already like a murderer. Because he was fulfilling the commandments. And you'll see it all in the Beatitude and all the words he spoke were the fulfillment of the principle of what God had put in place for those ten rules of relationships. And we're going to complete this next week in the final ones of the ten commandments. But I hope you've seen this as an understanding of the principles that we're to live by and grow by. So let's pray. Good. Father, we thank you that we pray for our nation. We pray for those that spitefully use us, that are against the morals and the values we believe we should have as a nation. We pray for anyone in office that's using their office to bring dishonor or disrespect to our president. We pray for them. We pray for those that are in a place that is feeding the spirit of entitlement feeding the spirit of dishonor. Maybe they have wisdom to change their plans and to understand how to do those things of honor that bring understanding and wisdom and mercy. We pray for anyone today that's found themselves in a situation where they continue to say those things of dishonor towards the ones they love, towards the ones they work with or they live with. Father, I ask that today we repent of those words of dishonor we've spoken. Let us be wise in what we say. Let us speak words of love. Let us pray those things to help that person or those situations to be turned out for good. Let us be a people of honor. Let us live well and live long on the earth. I pray this for each person here today and for our congregation and those watching. May you walk in the honor of the Lord towards your parents, towards your friends, towards your church, towards your nation, towards those in authority over you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So everyone needs prayer. I know that uh, we need to lift up the family across from Frank and uh, Ruth. That the, their child was run over this week. And I know Frank said, I think he would, the dad was run over also. He has a broken and, hip. Hmm? He has a broken hip. So the broken hip. Tomorrow. So, and what was his name? Um, Franz, Franz, F-R-A-N-T. Ron? Franz, his name is. Uh, so we need to, I'm going to have them stand there for that. It's a terrible situation. And the child was uh, killed. And uh, uh, they were right there when it happened across the street from their home. And so we need to lift up that family. And thank God that God had a praying and family to be with them in this. And so we need to lift them up. Um. Someone else have a prayer request? Uh, yeah, pray for a favor. I want to call us later tomorrow. Absolutely. You hold that, we're going to pray and you hold that card up. So that, Amen. Because God may need his help. He may need to read that. You know, yes, my wife? Uh, Ashley just texted me a while ago and said, Tyler's sick on a dog and i got to go get him now from work. Okay. And we'll pray for our family. Yes, Dennis? Uh, Dennis's daughter and granddaughter. And she went in the hospital? Yeah, her children went to... Diabetic fire. problem, yeah. Okay. Why don't you stand up for her? For yes, Lois. Oh, how's Audrey doing? Not good. Not good? Okay. I see her getting worse.
Oh, she's not improving. Oh, okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, we're trying to get our income, so when Scott's willing, I'm like this. Okay. Um, we're trying to get our income. Oh, for y'all home? Okay. Well, I'll pray for you. God can work out amazing things. I mean, amazing. Yeah, amazing. I'm amazed. Um, anybody else? Why don't you stand up for what you're believing for? Why don't we extend our hands towards heaven? Father, you know these requests. You know each situation for each person. You know the grace that needs to abound for this family that lost their little child. We pray for the healing for his hip and the restoration of his life and their life together. And to just let your words and your angels be on assignment to bring them thoughts of goodness and love and grace in this situation. We lift up Dorothy and Steve for the home they need. It's, it's there. As they seek and knock, you're going to open up the way for it to come together. You're going to open up the pathway that needs to be brought so it be the thing for them and the way they need it and how they need it to be done. We pray in Jesus' name. The same for Mike, for his employment request. We just think that uh, you open up the door for him to be able to work, to be a chaplain, and uh, do those things that God's prepared you, him to do, Lord, already with the licensing and things that are already done, that you bring that forth for him. We lift up Dennis's daughter that this diabetes come under control so that, that she be able to leave the hospital and be completely made right so she won't have to go back in Jesus' name. And uh, we lift up uh, our son-in-law, Tyler, that's sick. May he recover quickly from his sickness and make him whole. And uh, Father, we just thank you for uh, your abundant mercy and grace that prevails, your healing that comes, and your restoration. And that all our needs are provided for supernaturally by the power of God. And we just thank you for being the righteous, loving God you are in Jesus' name. Amen. People say, Amen. 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 Let's worship him as we close today. Hallelujah. Amen. We just did the, we did this one earlier, but it's a